Today's show is sponsored by Indie Film Hustle's Filmmaker Process. We provide filmmakers with professional services to get their films or series funded, finished, and distributed. For more information, go to filmmakerprocess.com. You you did a movie in the '80s, which was uh, one one of those classic '80s movies, which is about last night. So about so about last night is one of those amazing '80s films, and it's a very small. I mean, not small, but it's a it's a comedy. Uh, yeah. And then from from a, a controlled, more controlled comedy, you go to glory. Right. How the heck did that convert? Like, was it an agent? Was it the script? What, 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 like, what? Like, how did you get that gig? Because generally speaking, you don't go from romantic comedy to epic civil war movie <laughs> yeah it, it was it was one of those again f- flukes um i will say that i had obviously studied um american history so i had a very particular interest in it um i had uh, about last night had had the good fortune of doing well mm-hmm. it's a movie that was made inexpensively made a lot of money for the studio so they were predisposed to be interested in what I might be interested in. Mm-hmm. When I said that, you can imagine their response was the same as yours. <laughs> yeah. um, but, but, but there was a guy named Jeff Sagansky who had actually been in college with me, who had gone to work at that studio. So I had a, a personal connection with one of the executives there. Mm-hmm. And uh, two things. They said to me, finally, as I, as, as I first worked with Kevin Jar, um, when they were... Uh, Considering doing it, I was involved with a producer named Freddie Fields, who's a very sort of legendary character um, for any number of reasons in Hollywood as a producer and then having created what what is now ICM. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, we found out that there was going to be a reenactment of the 125th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg taking place on the field with the reenactors. And there were going to be thousands of men, maybe three or four thousand men on the field that day, July 4th, uh, 125 years after 1863. That would have been 63, 80, you know, it was like 89, something like that. And we convinced them to give us $25,000 or $20,000, whatever it was, where I could go with a friend of mine who's a cameraman and another cameraman we picked up in New York and Freddie and me to go onto that field and just shoot what it might look like. And I didn't know what I was going to see when I got there, but I read about these reenactors and we went there and we had to put on the union uniforms because they wouldn't let anybody on the field who wasn't actually in the reenactment. Mm -hmm. But there we were running around as a hundred degrees in in Gettysburg in this midsummer. And we, we shot hot, several thousand feet of film and I brought it back to LA and Steve Rosenblum, who was not yet an editor. He was actually an assistant. Um, but my, my close friend, we, um, took the film and at night in the cutting room, when he was done with his day job, we snuck in there and we cut the film together and put it to music and put together about, couldn't have been more than a five or six minute reel. Mm -hmm. But it was magic because it was the dust would come up and the horses would go through and these cannons would go off and 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 there was no narrative. Right. But it's a sizzle. it was but a sizzle. It was a sizzle. I I, I invented the sizzle apparently. <laughs> apparently, because I was like, this is the most amazing sizzle I've ever heard of. <laughs> exactly. And so we did that um and showed it to the studio. And the one thing the studios um, are, 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 sub, are, are subject to, and this is, I think, explains the sizzle, um, which is, oh, well, we're incapable of imagining it, but if you show me something that is, in fact, there, maybe maybe that makes it make sense. I mean, I, I find the sizzle to be a little bit offensive when someone's taking my film and 10 other directors' films and saying that they've done it, or that's how it's going to be, because God help them if they could do it the same way. Um, uh, but, but, that was one thing that happened. And they looked at it. They went, wow, that's pretty great. They said to me, we will make this movie for a certain budget if you can get Matthew Broderick to agree to do it. Now, Matthew Broderick at that point had done Ferris Bueller. Yeah. Not exactly the most logical trans, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> choice to play in this kind of movie. Right. But that began in a, a, a 
a bit of a conversation with Matthew and and um, some real hesitation he had about doing it and having to win him over to that idea. But the good news was they said, basically, if you could get Matthew Broderick to do it, then all the rest of those guys, you know, those those black guys, you know, uh, well, you know, you'll you'll take care of that. <laughs> yes. Which, just a couple guys, whatever, whatever. Doesn't matter. Which which, you know, amazing, amazing. It's an amazing story because, I mean, I had known Denzel because um, uh, the year before we had started 30 something and and, yeah. and and Denzel was um I think he was, he was there still doing Sandy Elsewhere at the time. Right, the right. That's right. He did Sandy and Elsewhere. I, yeah. And I'd seen Morgan do something at BAM. And Andre Brower uh, was still a senior. It was still in, uh, still in his final year at Juilliard. He mm -hmm. had never done anything before. But it, it, it bespoke something that's, I think, also interesting to talk about, mm -hmm. which is that their approach to it was essentially as a white savior narrative. Yeah, uh, right. And... And that's what they wanted the movie to be, and therefore there was a lot of um, a lot of pressure put on me uh, to really uh, lift up that character of Shaw and talk about his how he was trained and where he was born and how he got there. And there was literally but two reels of film, and and really to put the burden of the narrative on him. And I had to to write a lot of it. And in fact, as we started, I had to shoot a bunch of it. But it became abundantly clear that when I started rehearsing with um, the guys in the tent, with Denzel and Andre and Morgan and Jimmy, that there's that, that was the story. Uh, and the minute that we shot that first scene and looked at it in dailies, or let me back up for a second, when I looked at the stuff with Matthew alone, and it looked like a kind of bad movie for television because mm. it was arch and it was stilted and it was just something you'd seen before mm -hmm. but when i started realizing what these guys had it just all revealed itself to me and i began to um write more for them and figure out ways that there would be other scenes in which they would have t figured even more prominently in the plot and um so that when I finally showed the movie to the studio, I cut the first two reels. I literally began with Matthew Broderick on that field and that letter. And he meets Morgan Freeman, you know, three minutes into the movie when he's lying there on the field and uh, starts meeting the other guys, you know, six minutes later. Mm -hmm. Uh and the movie became what it became, which is not to diminish anything that Matthew did or, or to t diminish um, his import and, 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 and his performance. But these guys were in a state of grace. They were, they were representing something that I could only imagine or, 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 or humble myself in front of. Yeah. And, um, and, and from what I, you know, when I saw the film, uh, I mean, all I all I can remember from from the back of my head is Denzel. Just it's just Denzel. I mean, I, yeah. Mor Morgan and and everybody else and Matthew was great, but it's just Denzel. You just saw he became Denzel in Glory. Like he became. Yeah, well, that, he was. began a relationship with us where we made several more movies together. But right. but but one thing we'll say also, and this is how I tried to make that transition, and I think this is really important to say. I know that about last night was you know people in rooms talking. And 30 something, which had come right after at the or even around the same time, was the same thing. Mm -hmm. But I shot so much film, meaning in that movie and in those 40 episodes that had preceded this. Mm -hmm. um, like a lot of the directors that became really great directors who shot two reelers, you know, George Stevens, who had shot you know, uh, Max Sennett and, and uh, John Ford, who had shot, you know, crummy Westerns and, and all that shooting film, cutting film, doing it, figuring out what makes a scene work was again, uh, just about gaining a kind of felicity and, and, and a kind of chops as a jazz, you know, trumpeter might mm -hmm. playing finger scales as a pianist might. Um, and one more thing, which is I went back to some of the masters that I had so loved. And I think I watched Ron and Kagamusha and the seven samurai 
a hundred times mm -hmm. because what Kurosawa did with those movies, he did not have a lot of money and we didn't have a lot of money for glory. Mm -hmm. He showed me how to fill that frame and how to stage that in depth and how to give the impression of scale. Um, and I, you know, stole mercilessly from his technique, even though it was different, you know, uh, period and whatever. And I would have, I, I could afford, you know, four days in the movie where we had six or 700 extras or five days. Right? right. And I figured out how to space those shots when I needed them through the different aspects of the story. So that then when I only had 200 or even a hundred and filled and inserted those shots into the bigger shots in your mind as, as the audience, you're there among the 700 or 2000 of them. Cause you have to remember there was no CGI. None. That's all we in camera. Yeah. No, it's all in camera. We, yeah, we couldn't, we couldn't duplicate and tile and do any of those things. That's amazing. To watch the rest of this interview, head over to IndieFilmHustle.com.